Everyday life is an everyday battle, but it's not against flesh or blood. It's the seen and unseen arrows sent to attack our souls, hidden within the common. What we watch, what we read, what we listen to, what we love. Do you see it? This is where the battle lies. The darkness is pressing and will put up a fight, but we have access to the weapons that render the enemy powerless. Prayer, truth, peace, righteousness, salvation, the spirit. This is our armor. These are our weapons of warfare. So stand firm in faith and be battle ready. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. We are finishing up a three-part beginning to our series called Battle Ready. Uh, and if you haven't been here for any of the sermons or maybe you're tuning in online for the first time, let me encourage you to go back and look at the other two parts of the triangle. So just for example sake, let me draw the triangle up here and show you. What I made the case in the first sermon is that Satan, when he tempts Jesus in the wilderness, actually tempts him in three ways. And you remember this. He does that with three categories in our life of how he tempts us. You're probably saying, why are you gonna draw this triangle and what's the big deal? Because when you and I understand the schemes of Satan, we are able to declaw him. We are able to dethrone him. We're able to disarm him from the power he has over us. Anybody wanna learn how to do that? Amen? Uh, so this is, how, this is why we listen and learn this way. And so today, uh, we're gonna talk about the last part of the triangle. Two weeks ago, we talked about the temptation of appetite. Last week, we talked about the temptation of approval. Anybody two for two like me? Anybody, right? Yeah, I'm three for three, actually, as we <laughs> see today. Uh, and then I talked about how there are certain issues that the enemy uses in our life to cripple us. With appetite, he uses fear. Fear of not having enough, or fear of having just enough, not wanting to get rid of anything. Then approval, there is an issue of what? Do you remember this? Shame. You feel like no one likes you, no one accepts you, no one appreciates you. The final one we'll talk about today is ambition. Ambition. And the question we're gonna ask ourselves is this, am I accomplishing enough? Am I doing enough? And what we'll see is that at times, I think we all fall into this trap. Now, one of the cool things about men and women of the Bible is that you can put them in one or three of these categories. Very interesting. What do you mean? Think about Esau. Esau gave in to this, uh, this temptation of ambition, wanting to manipulate his brother. His brother, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob. Esau gave in to appetite, wanting to destroy things, ruined his life. Saul gave in to ambition, he wanted to be king. David gave in to appetite with Bathsheba, you kind of see this. Samson gave in to all of them, probably, right? I mean, just to be honest about Sam. Peter was always about approval, always about ambition, and Paul was the master of ambition, why? I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, born on the, or circumcised on the seventh day, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, as to the law, I was perfect, I was very ambitious. So, if you're like me, you're gonna ping pong between all of them. Today, we'll talk about the question, am I doing enough? Am I accomplishing enough? If you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We'll go back to the temptations. Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we'll look at verse 8 and following. If you're there, we like to say word at Long Hollow. We know it's the word that changes our life, and so I want to get into the word until the word gets into us. Verse eight, again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. He said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and angels came and began to serve him. Let's pray as we begin today. Father, we all want to succeed. 
we all want to do well. We all want to win. And there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is when the, when the means justify the end. And the means are compromise, manipulation, shortcuts. And so I pray today, God, that you would make us aware of this temptation in our own life. God, I find this one is the hardest one to really put a finger on because it's very easy to just say, I'm a hard worker, I I like to get things done, I'm a self-made man or a woman. And so God, would you, by your Holy Spirit, point out the areas that need attention. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place today. Have your way. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So the first, uh, the third temptation in the series is the temptation of ambition. Am I doing enough? Am I accomplishing enough? So Satan takes Jesus to a high mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms and all the empires and everything that comes along with that. And here's the line he says, if you do this, I will give you what? All these things. Now, here's the lie of Satan right right out the gate. Satan wants us to believe, and a lot of Christians fall for this, that we own something. That's what he wants. He wants us to believe that you and I actually own things. Well, pastor, wait a minute. I've got the deed to my house. Okay, what happens when you die? Who owns it then? Well, I got the title of my car. I know you do. But eventually, you won't have that car, and eventually, it'll be gone. So in reality, you and I own nothing in the scheme of eternity. We're only stewards of what God has given us. Now, I had, if I had more time, I would go down this rabbit trail, but for your sake, you're probably saying, thank God, because it's about money. And everybody loves a money talk, right? I mean, let's, let's just be honest. But the reality is this. I'll just say this about finances. It's almost as if, if God owns everything, the house you have, the car you drive, the family you lead, the business you have, the financial portfolio you built up, and the money in your bank account, if it's all God's, then could it be that money is God's tool to see who he can trust in this world? And many of you, and I've fallen into the trap years ago, by God's grace, I figured it out. When you are generous, God continues to bless you because he can trust you. And many of you, sadly, are gonna live and die your whole life and never get to the place of seeing the generous, faithfulness, honoring hand of God for those he can trust. Okay, I'm off the soapbox. Okay, now here's the scripture to prove that God owns it all. First Chronicles, watch this, 29, 12. Here's the scripture. Riches and honor come from you, Lord, and you are the ruler of everything. Okay, so watch what he's saying. Who's in control and ruling everything? God. Who gives everything? Any questions? It's God. None. Right, exactly. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Here's what Satan's doing. He's saying, Jesus, come here, man. Listen. (laughs) Yeah. You don't want to go to the cross, do you? I mean, that's going to be a lot of pain and suffering. We don't need to go down that Calvary road. All this talk about death, let's squash that. Let me just give it to you carte blanche. Right now, let me just give it to you now. You don't have to go through the suffering. You don't have to go through the pain. Let's just shortcut the process. And what happens is he wants Jesus to compromise the plan of God. Let me just remind you, there are no shortcuts to success in life, period. There are are no shortcuts to effectiveness. And Jesus knows a principle I want us to get. Jesus knows that the kingdom of God has to go through a road called Calvary. He cannot shortcut the process. He cannot go around the plan of God. Jesus knows that a crown only comes through a cross. And he has to go through the cross. Now, here's how ambition works. Because we're tempted to like shortcut. And we're tempted to do whatever it takes to be famous or successful or uh, to have ambition. So here's how it works. Write these down. On one side, you have strength or power, ambition, work. You're going to work hard, you know, strength. On the other hand, you're going to have weakness or disinterest. So one hand, strength, power, uh, work. On the other hand, weakness or disinterest. Let me show you how they work. I would say most people in here, and most people joining us from home, want to be successful. They want to be, they want to have, uh, they want to achieve goals. They want to succeed. Many of you want to succeed at all 
cost. You'll do whatever it takes to succeed in life. And I'm not saying it's bad to want to succeed. What's bad is when that's all you think about and your identity is tied to your success or what you do. Here's how you know if this is you. If every time you talk with someone, you're always boasting about what you've done. Hey, did I tell you about the sales I just closed at the office? Did I tell you about the investment I, I just made uh, and just had a return on? Did I tell you what cryptocurrency is doing now? You guys out just bought an NFT and a crypto. Did y'all know about that? Did I tell you about how many patients I just saw? Did I tell you how big the boat is in my house? And what happens is your identity is tied to what you've done. Did I tell you how successful my kids are? And did you look at the Instagram post of the grades my kid made that were better than you? Did I tell you they had all A's? Did I tell you how athletic my kids are and how I vicariously are living through them, although they wanted to quit two or three years ago? <laughs> did I hit everybody yet? Did I get everybody? Right, right. Did I tell you how big our church is or how big our... Did, did you know how many people we baptized last year or saw salvation? Did I tell you the new plan we're building on our campus? And here's what happens with that mentality. The end justifies the means. And when the end is the goal, meaning I've got to be bigger, I've got to be better, I've got to be more successful, then you will compromise along the way. This is how you know if you're in this category. Workaholism is a badge of honor. You know, we, we used, I used to say things like this, and I heard people say that. Man, I feel guilty if I rest. Anybody say that? You want to blow people away? You haven't seen somebody in a while? Next time they see you. Hey, how you been doing? Man, I've just been kicking back and... Just doing silence and solitude for months at home, man, just nothing. <laughs> just doing nothing. Really? Yeah, you ought to try it. It changed your life, you know what I mean? I mean, that's the reality. So, okay, maybe. But anyway, here's the thing. On one hand, you work a workaholic. On the other hand, here's what happens. And we can ping pong between the two. We detach when we can't win. If we can't succeed and we can't conquer, then we don't want any part of it. Nah, I'm not interested. I don't want to play. I detach and I'm uninterested. We, were, we lived in uh, Chalmette growing up. I lived in a, uh, I lived in Miro actually, which nobody knows Miro. But for those who don't know Chalmette, Chalmette's like Nazareth. You know, people here, I'm from Chalmette and they say, can anything good come from Chalmette? But anyway, that's kind of how it is. Uh, but, but Chalmette, we had, this, we had this street with a bunch of kids and a bunch of guys my age. So every day when I get home from school, we were throwing the football and we were playing baseball, obviously wiffle ball, uh, baseball. We were playing basketball. And uh, this kid across the street from us, he had parents who were pretty well off. He's probably the most well off family in the, in the block. And so he was the kid, you remember this kid, who was always getting the new sports uh, toys, right? Like you get the new football and we want to play with the new football, or you get the new wiffle ball set, or you get the new basketball. Or he, had the, he was the first to have strength shoes, remember those? I mean, this is that kid, right? And so he'd come out and play. But the problem with this kid was he was not very athletic. He was kind of quirky and he wasn't very coordinated. And so you know how kids do when you're playing baseball, you know, and somebody's like, man, I could throw a mailbox. You couldn't hit that. You know, kids would say that. Or, man, you got fingers like Butterfinger, right? And Richie would always do the same thing. It always ended this way. Right in the middle of it, he's like, ah, give me the ball. Come on, Richie, man. We... We're just playing, man. No, give me my ball. Give me my bat. Y'all remember this kid? Give me my bat. Come on, Richie, man. He, wouldn't, he didn't really mean that you had Butterfinger. I mean, he's just playing, you know? We were still playing. And what would Richie do? He would take the ball, he'd take the bat, and he'd go home. I'm not playing with y'all. Now, we don't do that as adults. We don't pick up the equipment and go home. What we say is things way more subtle. I don't want to hang with them anymore. Why? I just don't want to hang. Why? Because he makes me feel inferior to him. So I won't be around that. I don't want to go to that place anymore. I don't want to be a part of that church anymore. We don't want to do that. And so what happens is you detach from a situation because you cannot win. Now, here's what I found. You know who has the hardest time with ambition, the temptation of ambition? Former high school athletes. And I'll pick high school, not college, because I'll pick everybody in high school, maybe even Little League. We can go back to Little League, right? If you were athletic, if you played any kind of sport in your front yard, okay, basically that was you, right? Like, if you had any athletic bone in your body, here's why. Because the reality is we're over 40 guys, but that's not how our mind thinks, right? Anybody help me here? Like I'm 45, but I'm still, I'm still 22 in my mind. I mean, I can still dunk a basketball. You give me a shot in the right, you know, 
right? Service time. So in our mind, we're 22, and you don't think you're old, but ask your wife, she'll tell you. And this is how you know. I mean, this is how we know. When you used to play in the church softball league or the basketball team or pick up games at the Y, you'd go home and recover the next day and walk into work, and you can brag with your buddies about it, right? Now what you do is you come home and you have to soak for an hour in a hot bath of Epsom salt. <laughs> Wives, am I right? And then, babe, you think, can you rub the big guy? I did that yesterday, just one more time. You know, babe, can you rub the big guy? And, and you're getting older. And this is how you know you're getting older. I mean, if I sleep on a pillow that's not my own, my neck's jacked for like a week, you know? It's like, <laughs> the world's going. But here's the reality. The reality is you and I live in this perpetual state, if we're not careful, of romanticizing the past. Now, follow me here. And I'm speaking to a few men and, and women here. Don't miss this, because I've been here. You can sit for hours and hours and think, what could have happened if, man, if my parents would have just held me back one more year? I mean, I graduated high school at 17. What if I would have graduated like the rest of the kids? That, I mean, I could have gone to a higher D1. What if I would have gone to UNC Greensboro and not William Carey? Some of you say, well, you'd be in hell right now. I get that, but <laughs> no, 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 no. that's an easy one. That's what my sister told me, you'd go to hell. But anyway, but let's just take that one out. What if I wouldn't have smoked cigarettes when I went to school and college at the time? What if I wouldn't have broken my ankle? I mean, so what happens is you just insert your life. How many people find themselves doing it? If I would have done this differently. And what I find is, guys particularly, the reason you and I fantasize, even romanticize about that is because at a stage of our life, high school, college, people respected us. We felt like somebody. People, on, you know, they, people treated us a certain way. And so what happens is we romanticize the past. Now here's the problem. When you live in the past or wanna go back to the past, you hinder God working in the present and you cripple God working in your future. This is how it works. Because your identity is found in what you did. Let me just remind you today. Your identity is not found in what high school basketball team championship you were on. Your identity is not found in what you did in college. Your identity is not found in what you do today. Your identity is not found in what team you play on or how big your sports or, or portfolio is. Your identity is found in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God loves you not based on what you can do for him, but what Christ has already done for us. And here's the reality. Your value is found and not what, what you do, but how you receive from Christ. Now, if, it's, if you change that mindset, what happens is it changes everything. Because you realize that a lot of your striving, a lot of your working is for your own. It's for your own benefit. It's your own approval. And what happens is the enemy just implements this little tool, and here's the tool that will cripple you, paralyze you. Here's the tool that the enemy uses with the ambition issue. Anybody want to take a guess at it? Guilt. Guilt. Satan is a master of a guilt trip, right? Anybody ever felt guilty before? I mean, that's what he does to Jesus. He says, listen, if you just bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, I find fascinating, I don't want to dwell here, but I find it fascinating that Jesus doesn't even correct him. Like, you don't even own these. What are you talking? It's all mine anyway. He doesn't even correct him. But, but in a sense, Satan is kind of right because God said he would be the prince of the power of the air, the earth. So God has abdicated authority to Satan that only he allows him to have, obviously. But he says, listen, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all these things. And what Satan wants Jesus to feel is the same thing he wants us to feel. I want you to get this. He wants us to feel that if we pass on the opportunity, we will feel guilty for not taking it later. That's the culture we live in today, especially our young people. We're raising a generation of young people, children and grandchildren, who live in a culture where they cannot miss out. Can't miss that. I gotta go on the road trip. I never, I'll never go again. You know, the McRib's only here. You know, he's like, yeah. well, that was me. Okay, that was me. But anyway, anyway that's me. But I mean, that's what we live in. And, and the coach says, you gotta go on a road trip. You gotta, uh, you gotta stand in line 
for the iPhone, you know, 16, because if I don't get the first run of it, I'm not gonna get it. You know, I gotta go uh, call and repeatedly click on Best Buy to get the PS5, like many of you did, <laughs> you know? And, by, and what I realize now is by the time the PS6 comes out, nobody's gonna have the PS5. So, I mean, that's kind of how it works out. But that's it, we gotta get in line. I gotta buy this stock. I gotta get this crypto, I gotta, I gotta get these things now. I gotta mint these NFT. I gotta get them now, because if I miss them, I miss out. That's a fear of missing out. They call it FOMO. You ever heard of that, FOMO? Young people call it fear of missing out. I gotta have it now, and I feel it too. Recently, when I started to acknowledge this pressure in my life, I changed the acronym. Robert's my assistant. He can affirm this. My wife can affirm this. I've actually flipped it, going from one end of the scale, which is called fear of missing out. Young people particularly write this down. I call it now the fun of missing out. That's what I call it now. The fun of missing out. Because here's what I've learned, and I want you to understand this. Everything you and I say yes to, we say no to five or 10 things. Every yes carries with it five or 10 no's. What do you mean? If someone asked me to go speak in an event, which for years I think, man, I've been waiting to go speak here my whole, I gotta go, wow, this is awesome. I've been praying about it. Gotta go, babe, you know, gotta go. What happens is when I say yes to a speaking event, I say no to a few things, even if it's an off day. I say no to candy. I say no to rig and rider. I say no to resting. I say no to recuperating. And ultimately I say no to long hollow because now I'm coming in after being gone. And so there's a lot of no's when I say one yes. And so now I just relish in saying no. Just have the fun of saying no. Guys, listen to me. If you say yes to go golfing with your buddies, ladies, if you say yes to go shopping with your friends, if you say yes to go fishing with your college roommates, I'm not down in those things, you gotta weigh out what are the no's that I'm saying no to. Let me remind you of something. This is the line that changed my whole life with this. An older, wise pastoral mentor said to me, Robbie, when someone calls you to do something and asks you to do something, it is never for your benefit, always for theirs. Now think about that. It is never for your, now, what do you mean? They don't want me to speak? Yeah, they want you to speak, but they want to draw a crowd. They want to get people to come. They want, and, and, and that's with anybody. Hey, can you come? Always for their benefit, never for ours. And that's what Satan does. He guilts us. He guilts us to burn us out, that we're gonna miss something, we gotta accomplish something. So the voice in our head says, man, you're never going to do enough. You're never gonna accomplish enough. You're not working hard enough, Robbie. Now the voice is not this, this is not the voice. The voice is not you're not doing anything. Because you're doing something, you say, yeah, I'm doing something. I go to work every day, I take care of my family, I go to church, what do you mean? I'm not doing anything for the Lord, I go to church, what are you talking about? It's not do I don't do anything, it's I'm not doing enough. And so what do you do? You incessantly, as an OCD person, obsess about keeping the house clean just in case a visitor may come over, right? I mean, you gotta keep everything, and some of you ladies, you know what I'm talking about, gotta keep everything perfect just in case someone comes. Or if you're a person who likes to cook, mom, you're just killing yourself in the kitchen working for hours while people are sitting and hanging on the couch because you just can't sit still. I mean, this is my gift. This is what I, what I do. I do that. Or guys, you just work overtime. You go to the office. You're late at night because you just feel bad about coming home early. Or, or worse than that, you just, you just travel way too much. And Sally, you've sacrificed your business on the altar of your family. And you're probably saying, well, is that me? Let me see if that's you. This is how you know if you're a person tempted with ambition. If you have said to your spouse, and your spouse can affirm this, babe, listen, honey, listen. It's only gonna be for a season, I promise. In a, in a year, in one year, it's gonna be done. We're back to normal. Just bear with me for a year. And here's the reality. That year has come and gone, and it's long gone in the rear view. And you're still working. Ambition. And long haul, if you're like me, guess who's the worst critic? Me. Guess who has the highest bar? Me. Guess who puts the, the greatest expectations that are never able to be achieved? Me. 
See, what ambition does is this. This is the root. Ambition causes us to believe that you and I have unlimited capacity. That's what it causes. It causes us to believe we have unlimited power, that we don't need to rest and we don't need to recharge. I'm convinced the reason God built in the paradigm of sleep, follow this, the reason God built in the paradigm of sleep and human beings was to prove that he is God and we are not. Why? Because God doesn't need a rest. We do. You do. And so the best advice I can give you right now, you need to recharge, you need to rest. Here's some advice, and this may be worth the whole sermon, just honestly, so listen. This is the best advice you could take home. Some of you, and you're gonna say, pastor told me to do this, hon, I'm the babe, you know, hubby, you know, pastor said we gotta do this. You need to go home after lunch. You need to find a nice little place on the couch. You need to turn the sports game on, and you need to watch the Saints beat the pants off of the duck. <laughs> Can I get a hoot at? Can I get a hoot at? Anybody from who? And then as they're losing, you just need to doze off to sleep and take a nap for the glory of God. I mean, just like for the glory, this game's over, I'm playing. I love the Titans when they're not playing the Saints, okay? Hoot at, yeah, I get the hoot at you. But anyway, but anyway, but here's the, re here's the reality. You need to rest. Some of you right now are at the point of burnout. You know who the last person to burn out is? The one who says, I'm not burned out. What are you talking about? I'm just getting started. Boom, they lose it all. And some of you are dangerously close there. See, the way you overcome ambition is by looking to Jesus. I said this all through the series. Jesus becomes what we deserve. He absorbs what we should have received. So Jesus, in a sense, becomes weak in order for us not, not to ha be, become weak, not have to be. So Jesus becomes weak. Where does that happen? On a cross. The giver of life becomes death. I mean, you can't get any weaker than dying, not just as a man, but as the son of God who created all of mankind. The one who gave breath, lost breath, in order for us who were weak not to become weak. But it doesn't end there. He goes into the grave, he's resurrected from the dead, and then he conquers death, hell, and the grave to show us that he has victory over all things. So when you start feel like, man, I'm getting drawn into prove myself or work or, or, or be somebody or, or, or be a workaholic, remind yourself that you don't have to please anybody and you don't have to prove anything. See, what I do is instead of resting in the, in the grace of God, what I do is I'm gonna work hard and I'm gonna prove myself and I'm gonna show people that, man, I'm, I deserve to be here. And then when I don't win, here's what happens. I'm gonna find a place to win. So what I'll do is I'll, start, I'll ping pong from the ambition to approval. And then I'm gonna find a bunch of people that I can fish in their pond to get approval and affirmation to make me feel good about myself. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fish that, because I'm gonna win at that. I don't know how to win at that. But if I don't get that and I don't win at that, then I'm gonna ping pong back and I'm gonna tear up some Twinkies or some Swiss cake rolls because I know I can conquer them. Appetite, you see how it works? I mean, that's how it works. If I can't win here, I'm gonna win here. I'm gonna win somewhere. And God reminds me, listen, Put down your striving, put down your approval seeking, and find it in me. See, when you start finding yourself pinging back and forth between those different parts of the triangle, ask yourself this question. This is worth the whole series right here. Write this down. Ask yourself this question. What is the root cause? Why do I need people to approve me? Why do I buy Amazon packages at 11 p.m. every night incessantly? Why do I have to scroll endlessly through photo after photo after photo on Facebook and realize an hour later I did nothing? I mean, why am I doing, there's something going on here. Why do I work so hard? Why do I feel like I'm guilty when I know there's something here? So ask yourself, what is the root problem? And then ask three questions. What am I afraid of? Write this down, what am I afraid of? What do I feel shame over? What do I feel guilt about? And then when you start asking the Holy Spirit to do some deep spiritual work in your soul, then you get to the place where you say, God, I need to receive your grace, acknowledge my weakness, and rest in you. Everything I just explained to you was contrary 
to the rubric I had in my mind when I became a Christian. I mean, everything, the paradigm I had as in the world was contrary to everything I just told you. When I was 19 years old, I was a second year student in college and got invited by one of my friends to what was called a public business reception. It was in New Orleans. Brought my dad with me because I didn't have any money. I was a college student, so I didn't have any money. Um, but I brought my dad with me and they promised that because of the deregulation of phone service and local service and electricity and internet deregulation, that uh, the market is going to explode in the future. And so at 19 years old, uh, they invited us to be in this network marketing company called American Communication Network. Um, I didn't have any money, my dad did. So I said, dad, would you put up the $500, which he did. And then he said, hey, listen, here's the deal. You have the time and you have the passion. I have the Rolodex, right? You just work, you just work the, the people I know. And so collectively, my father and I went into business together and by God's grace, we started to explode. The first week we broke the record in the city, hit the next position. Six months later, we hit the next position, broke the next record. And uh, at that time, I was 19, 20 at the time, I was traveling all over speaking and leading these public business receptions. If the money was right and it fit in your time schedule, would you be interested in looking at a serious business opportunity? I still remember the line, I mean, that's the thing I would say. And uh, at 19, they would write articles about us. They call me the wonder boy. This guy's the next big thing. And I started to believe in myself, like, man, I'm really making things happen. And so I started to learn from guys like Omar, uh, Omar Perry, who got to see him in person, Zig Ziglar in person, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, met him twice, took a picture with him. People say, you look like Tony Robbins, kind of. A, uh, I mean, those were my role models. And my motto in life was this, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. I mean, I'm a self-made man. If it's gonna happen, I'm gonna make it happen. That's the mindset I had. And then I became a Christian. And for about a year, I brought that mentality into my Christianity and I went to seminary. Now you gotta remember, I'm at seminary, less than a year removed from a $200 heroin and cocaine addiction. God has a sense of humor. I mean, I'm in class with guys, I mean, David Platt type of guys, Tony Marita type of guys, and there's me still dressing like he's going to the clubs with a $50,000 Cadillac in the parking lot. Not blaring Eminem, but now DJ Madge and Cross Movement and KJ52, can I get an amen, right? I mean, I, that's what it was. But I didn't know any better. And these guys naturally shun me because they're like, man, what do we do with this guy? He's preaching, he, he's a, just a new Christian. But it just fueled the temptation of ambition. Why? Because I'm gonna show them. And there's nobody gonna work harder than me. So I committed to making good grades. I committed to preaching more than these guys preach. I committed to memorizing more scripture than these guys. I committed to writing more than these guys. And this ambition, this drive in my own life. And then I met a man named Tim LaFleur. Uh, Tim had uh, gone to Glorietta. Tim and Chris LaFleur had taken college students to Glorietta, about 160 that year we took. And uh, he needed a camp pastor and a, and a women's minister to kind of lead that group of students. And uh, he asked uh, somebody at the seminary, who should I take? And they said, well, there's a new guy. He's new to the Lord. Uh, his nickname's Ignorance on Fire, uh, which was my nickname. I didn't know a lot about the Lord, but the little I knew, I was really passionate. And he said, I'm gonna take a chance on this guy. And Tim takes me to Glorietta, New Mexico. And for 10, uh, 11 weeks, it's like walking with Jesus, 24 seven discipleship, talking theology and questions, discipleship. And I remember, where I was, I was in a black rolling chair in the office with Tim and Michelle, the other girl, and Tim was investing in us and he said this line that changed my life. He said, let me just tell you right out the gate, you can do nothing in your own power and strength for the Lord. Now, knowing what I just told you about me coming to Christianity, I said, are you sure you can't do just like a few things for the Lord, like something, if you really work hard, you know what I'm saying? He's like, no, no, let me remind you what scripture says. Scripture says that in Isaiah, your righteousness is filthy rags to the Lord. Tim says the best you can offer to God is still unacceptable. Let me remind you, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny him what? Self, deny herself, pick up their cross daily, follow me. And when he finished that line, I sat back in that rolling chair for about a minute in silence. And I said, Tim, Brother Tim, 
you just wrecked my whole worldview. I mean, like you just wrecked my whole life. I don't even have a category for what you just said. Now, some of you are hearing that now for the first time and you're like, Pastor Robbie, I'm on that striving treadmill right now. I'm trying to work hard. I wear work as a badge of honor right now. I am simply worn out because I've been climbing this ladder of success and the sad reality for some of you, and here's a sad reality, some of you are gonna get to the top of that ladder of success that you've been climbing only to realize one day it's leaning against the wrong wall. It's the wall of self-promotion, the wall of self-indulgence. See, I would say many of you in here don't even know why you're created by God. You don't even know what God uniquely created and gifted you for. You're just aimlessly going through life and the devil wins, why? Because if he can keep you busy, he can keep you inactive. If he can keep you busy with life and things and temporal things, he wins in the end. And I just wanna encourage you, starting point, which people are like, why, why would I go to starting point? I've been here for 20 years. No, starting point is not for new Christians or new members. Starting point is for everyone to have a starting point. We're gonna show you why God created you, gifted you. So let me remind you as we close this whole series, here's the key. And I wanna give this to you kind of like a healing balm to you today. Remember, look at me. You have nothing to prove and no one to impress. You say that again. You have nothing to prove and no one to impress. And I've learned from personal experience, it's a whole lot easier doing ministry with Jesus than doing ministry for Jesus. For years I did ministry for Jesus, I promise you. And that's a whole lot of work. But it's so much better to do ministry with Jesus and be filled by the power of the Spirit and alongside of Jesus. I mean, that's what he said, right? Come to me all who are weary and heavy burden. And I have to believe many of you are there. And he says, come to me and I'll give you rest for your souls. Why? For my burden is easy and my yoke is what? What do he say? Light, light. That's a word you hadn't heard in a while, huh? Light. Light. Friends, Jesus never promised us an easy life, but he has promised an easy yoke. Would you rest in him today? Some of you are on the brink of throwing in the towel, burning out, marriages on the rocks, hanging on by a thread, businesses almost it, ministry ready to quit. I just can't help but believe in a culture that we live in today, many of you need to hear this word, stop striving in your own power and you just need to rest in the grace of God. And so I'm gonna ask you to come, would you just bow for a moment? I'm gonna kneel with you like I have every week. And some of you need to come now, so you're just gonna come now, but here's who I want to come. Uh, you don't have to tell me a word, you don't have to say anything like, like in the past. In, in your coming, you're just saying, I need rest. And the ones who need it the most are gonna ping pong between guilt and shame because the shame of the enemy is gonna kick in and say, if you come forward, people are gonna think you need rest, so let me shame you. So if that's you, brother, you come right now. I just want you to come. If you need rest right now, if you're burnt out right now, so let's bow our heads for just a moment. I'm gonna join you on my knees as well. If you need rest, if you need to lay down your striving, if you need to lay down the burden of guilt right now, you just feel guilt on your back, never enough, always more, never accomplishing, always doing, always trying to live up to the expectation of my parents or my grandparents or trying to be someone I'm not. So I'm gonna ask you, others are coming, you come right now. If you just need to come, just make your way out of your seat. You're just, Pastor, I'm tired. I'm tired. I need the grace of God. If you're in the balcony, we'll wait for you. Others are coming now, you come. Business owner, you're tired. Wife, single mom, you're exhausted. Keeping the marriage in check, you need to come. I'm tired. I need God's grace right now. If you're desperate enough, I promise you'll come. If you can do it on your own, stay in your seat. That's fine, God knows that, he knows that. But if you're desperate for the grace of God, You'll come. Jerry Bridges said this line and it's been implanted upon my soul and here's the line, I want you to hear it. He says, on your worst day, you're never beyond the reach of the grace of God. Such a great promise. Because there are days when you feel like, where is God? Where is the power of God? On your worst day, you're never beyond the reach of the grace of God. But on your best day, 
you are still desperately in need of the grace of God. So if you need grace upon grace, you come. And as you're bowing down, I just want you to get alone with the Lord for a moment and just tell God, you're tired. God, I've been striving, I've been earning. Think about grace is the moment we earn it, it ceases to be grace. The moment we say, God, look at what I've done, it ceases to be grace. Don't you remember what I, don't you remember how much I, it ceases to be grace. And so God, grace is when you give it to us, we say, wow, we don't earn it. Why, why would we receive something like this? And so God, would you give us grace? Those watching online, God, who are just burnt out and overwhelmed, heavy laden, God, would you give them rest for their soul? Would you let them get in your yoke, which is easy and light, God, and they would feel that lightness. God, would you take the shame and the guilt away, God, that the burden would be lifted on those who are kneeling right now. God, I know there's something special about people who step out in public. There's something special about publicly declaring uh, that I need you. And so God, would you meet us now, right now? Would you remove the shame and guilt? And God, would you let us lay down our striving? We have nothing to prove and nobody to impress. We love you, Lord. We ask it in the only name we know how. That's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ.